everyone. Happy Sabbath. And we're going to begin our study here with a word of prayer. <clears throat> the dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath hours. Um, I know here it's still a little while to the Sabbath, but we still ask for your Spirit's presence and that we can have that special blessing that you promise us on the Sabbath. And any time two or three are gathered together, we know that you're in our midst. And we just pray, Lord, that this Sabbath can be a blessing in spite of the sorrowing uh, that many people have, that we have. And um, we just pray, Lord, that... The truths that we study can encourage us and strengthen us. Help us to follow and serve you. Help each person to understand the things that they learn and that they can apply them in their walk and in their contact with others. Guide us now in this study is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath. And... Uh, this diagram here, this is um, what we're going to look at and, and, and another diagram that I, I did email out um, that relates to this. And I want to go through uh, the logic of what I see here. Now, I didn't see Colin's presentation. So this is from Colin's presentation uh, last Saturday night. And um, but some of the things should be quite obvious. And so we're going to we're going to go through that. So if anybody you know has any input, if anybody did see his study and I get something wrong, I'm happy to be corrected. Now what we see at the top, of course, is the prophetic mirror, and the prophetic mirror gives us these um, spans of time: 19 years and 46 years, and its mirror: 46 years and 19 years. And the two 2520s, of course, create this, and we have uh, 742 BC way on the left and 1863 on the right. And we know that there's this civil war in 742 and the civil war in 1863, and uh, the north and the south, and these become types. So we've studied these things before in the past. I've gone into Ellen White's Civil War Visions. Uh, so there's lots to it and a whole line of the civil wars and um, the going all the way back to Rehoboam and Jeroboam, uh, the civil war that happens there, going all the way back there and leading into Trump's presidency and a d date there, November 22nd, 2018. I'm not going to go into that study, but we had a whole chain and line uh, that uh, connected what was happening in the United States during Trump's presidency as a civil war. And, of course, that civil war has continued. So, and, and there might be things that if we looked at the American Civil War um, in the 1860s, we could even find more as we look at this, but I haven't tried to compare any of these dates or spans at this time, but what we have is um, a day for a year. So Colin on the left side there, he looks at the American election in 2020. So um, we have that on November 3rd, and we all know what happened. It didn't go Trump's way, but it took quite a while to sort out, and there was lots going on. Um, and I doubt any of us really know the truth of any of that. I mean, we can, we have our guesses about what happened. There seems to be a lot of things that don't make mathematical sense to me. Um, you know, a lot of people who used to vote, report, uh, vote Republican, once they die, they tend to vote Democrat. So, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting that way, but um, not enough for the media or the governments or the people in power uh, to do anything about what happened in the election. And so we know that there was this info war going on. And then on January 6th, the siege in Washington, and we've already marked that and it's part of a structure. Um, so 
he has there 19 and 26. Now, I'm not sure what um, – he doesn't put a date there, but he's just, I think, dividing the 65 days that he can divide it in 19 and 46. Now, he's going to use 19 there, not to really represent days as much, um, but to represent a um, – now, does anybody know the date that Biden was declared uh, president? I mean, I remember I was driving. It was a Sabbath because I was at Collins and I was driving home. I thought it was a day after, if I remember right. No, was day it the day after? No, they put day it after. tentatively. There was this time that they had a celebration. They finally had decided it was sort of quasi-official. So, yeah, they may have declared him president as far as the media was concerned but then there came a point where they finally decided he was president and people actually celebrated his win does anybody know um when that was i, uh, I, I was gonna look it up and then i, I started looking up and got distracted uh, reading some other stuff okay so if somebody could find that out it would be interesting but we don't know at this moment, but somebody will find that. And um, so the 19 here for, is the 19th Republican president and the 46th um, the Democrat, 46th president, right? So you got the 19th Republican and the 46th uh, American president. And you can see that they're, they're reigning at the same time, so to speak. There's this crossover that the American... Uh, uh, system has. You have a, a president-elect and then he's going to be inaugurated on January 20th. Now, and that's sort of what we expected is that January 20th would be this date that was marked. Um, but we had this siege on January 6th. And now the 65 days there that Colin has is an ordinal count. It's actually 64 days if you just counted whole days from November 3rd to January 6th. So if you started at midnight on November 3rd, it would be 64 days to midnight, January 6th. But he's counting it as 65 days. So he's counting those as um, ordinal count. Um, now, the interesting date that we put there, if you count 19 days past November 3rd, you're going to have November 22nd. So it is in November 22nd, 977 BC, that the prophecy of Josiah is given. And, uh, you know, summing up some of these things where we, we can look into them in more detail later if you need to. Um, so November 22nd is also a prediction that, uh, that we made back in 2018 regarding Trump, called the Thanksgiving Day prediction or Thanksgiving prediction. And um, nothing of particular, anything that we predicted happened, but we do see it as a significant date in Trump's president, presidency. You know, yeah. It looks like November 7, 2020 is what I can find. So they have November 7 that he's declared by the, by the media. Yes, well, yes. Yeah. I know that's not the date that everybody celebrated. Well, it says uh, people celebrate on Black Lives Matter Plaza across from the White House in Washington, D.C. on November 7, 2020. Okay, so yeah. was it after? Yeah. Hmm, okay. After Joe Biden was declared the winner of the 2020 presidential election. Okay. Yeah, that is the Saturday. So maybe I guess it, it, it wasn't as long as I thought. I thought it was a little bit longer than that. Okay. So by November 7th, so the, they had the election on Tuesday, November 3rd. And then by that Saturday, that's when they're going to have the celebration. Yeah. Looks like it. Okay. So we'll keep that in mind. So, you know, it would have been, you know, obviously it wouldn't have been November 22nd because that's a Sunday. But uh, I was wondering if it was going to be close to that. Um, but yeah, so if it was that soon. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And 
and then we have of course the 40 day, 46 days as these symbols so we have the days for a year in this structure now we're going to have the time from january 6 to the midterm election so colin hasn't drawn out these spans i'm going to show you what these are and that there is a mathematical connection that connects to our symbols uh, but he's going to have november 8th there the midterm election so this isn't going to be a presidential election and he has here uh, donald trump as again the 19th republican president now what exactly colin thinks is going to happen on that date i don't know does anybody or after november 8th so the 46 and the 19 whether these are days i don't think so I don't think he's expecting 65 days from November 9th or November 8th um, to be marked, but I don't know. He just puts the symbols there, and so they could mean they could mean a lot of things. I mean, they could represent something else. But we can see that those he's got, he's got info wars there. Yeah, he's got an info war in there. So yeah, the info wars. So maybe that's something to do with that. Yeah, he's got it on both sides. So he has this. Yeah was part of the propaganda that's that's happening um so so i don't know so I'm, you know I, if somebody had been there and seen colin's presentation then you could maybe give us some help but what i'm trying to say is that that this is valid at least as far as this november 8th date as you will see but as whether these are 46 days and 19 days or whether this is some other symbol something that's unforeseen on our our part um so we don't know what that means that's all i can see is it's not it's not something that's clear now one of the things of course we can point out, point out is that trump was born in 1946 so and and it was June fourteenth, I believe, nineteen forty six. Um, and here we're going to have forty six nineteen, so we're going to have this inversion. Now, could we expect that this is a period of? Would that is that necessary that this needs to be a period of days? So let's just, you know look at what's here would we at the end of that is no date okay so if you're going to go 65 days past november 9th or november 8th pardon me you're going to come to what date and and if we did it as an ordinal count so January 12th. Yeah, so it's going to give us like January 12th. And that's the ordinal count, right? Just counting 64 days from November 8th. Uh, that was 65. Hang on. Okay, so it's it, January. Be January 11th. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's because that's what I thought it was, January 11th. And January 11th is a symbol that we have. Um, where else do we find January 11th? Well, 666 days before the midterm election would be another instance of January 11th. That'd be January 11th, 2021, right? So what does that tell us about these spans of time? I don't, I don't, what we can look at, I can maybe draw this in here. Okay, well, let's take a look. I'm going to go to this and we'll modify it a little bit. Now, some of this we've studied in uh, the chronology that we've dealt with. Um, 
in Stephen's chronology, uh, with the baptism of Christ, with the crossing of the Jordan River, um, we have a period of 519 days. So this symbol is the time from when Trump wins the election in November 9th, 2016, to the siege of Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2021. So this part is a chart that Stephen did. Um, I just drew it out again. And <clears throat> so it's 7 times 31 weeks. 31 weeks is 217 days. And 7 times 21, 7. So 21, 7 is a symbol of July 21st, which is midnight. Right, so 217 we know is this, this symbol. And we can see it's also 1,519 days. And then it's going to be go to the siege of Washington on January 6th. So I put in this 65 days of Collins from November 3rd to January 6th. Okay, so that makes sense to people. You can see the November 22nd date in there. And notice also that I, I wrote it as 4546 because of the ordinal count. If it was here, I'm doing a cardinal count to 19 days. And so the ordinal count would then just include the whole of January 6th to make it 65 days. So it's from the beginning of November 3rd at midnight to the end of January 6th at midnight is 65 days. But you can see we have this 4546. So this is a symbol of the transition from the 45th president to the 46th president. Any thoughts on that? Is that logical to, to do this this way? I think the logic is there. Okay. Now, we also have an additional two weeks to Biden's inauguration. So these two weeks, since this is um, 217 weeks, if we go to Biden's inauguration, it's going to be 219 weeks. So if I zoom back out, um, but it's also 1,533 days. So this is what Stephen had noted, that Trump won the election on November 9th, 2016. And we have this symbol, which goes from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. We have this symbol here now being applied um, between Trump and Biden. Now, you can see this 219 weeks, what I've done is I've expanded uh, this line of Collins, or not really expand, but measured it, I guess, more like. He has the midterm election, and, and he's focused on this, so I've added in Stephen's line that we have to Collins' line. And we can see this is 2,190 days, so you can see in that 2190 the same symbol of the 219 weeks. Any other thoughts on this? Does this, does this give validity to the November 8th midterm election date as being connected to this structure? Because every time we look at a date, it's nice to see, you know, we can, we can find dates that are connected. But if they're not connected to a structure, you know, like they might have some numerical significance, but we need the structure first. And so we already have the structure. We just now have measured it. That is giving some validity to the situation with the with November eighth. 
Right. So it's connecting something. What it's connecting would be a guess from my perspective. That is, we don't know what it what it can be. It's not predicting anything. There's no there's nothing in these symbols that can tell us what November 8th is, but it is something that we have on a line and it's a valid line. That's the main thing I'm trying to point out here. So God is giving us this information, the information that Stephen has given us, the information Colin has given us, other information that Odilio has given us, and that we found in our morning studies. And these things start to give us a picture, but it's trying to interpret what this means that becomes the problem. So, but we can see that there is a validity here. Now we have another one that I think is more significant. From the siege of Washington, D.C., to the November 8th midterm election. This is the, the particular point that we have, and I'm just going to copy this and put it over here. I don't think it'll, I need to copy that to you. And I'm going to have to switch it around a little bit, but I'm going to put this into this diagram. And I have to switch these, so this is going to be 46. This is going to be 19, and I'm not saying that, that Colin is counting days here. I'm just putting these symbols here. And I don't know, somebody could figure out what these dates are. And we probably don't need this whole line. Okay, so, so we can have these 65 days over here. Again, so this is what Colin has given us, whatever this date is, that would be 46 days past November 8th. And I'd probably do this one as the cardinal count, and then this one, I think it's December um, 24. December 24th, and that's, that's uh, an ordinal count or a cardinal? You're just counting directly 46? I think yeah, I just did 46. Okay, so 12. So we get Christmas, Christmas Eve. Okay, and I guess, you know, I didn't put the year here, but we're just, we know that this is in 2022. So I could probably put the year in there, but I won't. Okay, so... So we have this. So Colin gives us this span of time, and I'm just going to show this to you again so you can see this. Um, is it not showing up? There it is. <clears throat> so Colin's given us this span of time between January 6th and November 8th, but he didn't measure it. But we have now measured it, and we can tell you something about it. <clears throat> so it's going to be 672 days. Now, 672 days has um, divisors, um, 7, 8, and 12. And so what do we see when we look at 7, 8, and 12? So we 7 times 8 times 12 equals 672 days days what do we see seven times eight times twelve what is that symbol there it's the same digits you would have in july 18 2020 right so we're going to have those same Another iteration of those digits. So you can see the 1872. It's not in the same order we usually look at it, but we still have those, those symbols there. Um, so we would have to say with these two or three witnesses that we have, um, we can see that there's a connection. We also see this 94 weeks, there's 94 days is well, 94 weeks, there's 94 days 
um, when we go to from midnight from the first day of the first month to midnight and then another 94 days when you go from July 21st 1844 to October 22nd 1844 um, that's 188 if you add it together but we're, we're doing it um, that's how we've normally counted it even though so they're both kind of ordinal counts you're counting uh, midnight twice it's kind of a weird way to count but that's one of the ways that we have counted those days from the first day of the first month to the tenth day of the seventh month but it's really 187 uh ordinal days not 188 ordinal days but anyway so we have that symbol there it's also uh the ninth day of the fourth month which is when uh the walls of jerusalem were broken down in 586 bc and it's also an inversion of 49. So, so there's lots of different symbols in that period of time from Biden's inauguration to the midterm election. Okay. And then um, what was the date again the, for the 64 days? January 11th. It's January 11th. Okay, right. So I'm just going to copy this. So that's going to be January 11th, 2023. And just change that. Okay. So, so that is a symbol, the 111. Um, so that ties also to our symbols. So even if we put them as days, I'm not saying that Colin was doing that. Whoops. Where did this go? I was meant to just make it bigger. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so we have January uh, 11th marked uh, in a number of different ways. What else, what else can we see here? I know, you know, you're looking at something sort of for the first time. Some of you might have looked at it after I emailed it. But is there anything in here that would suggest that this structure is not valid? So this is Collins, basically his structure, again, with Stevens' structure. And we can see that this connects it all together. So what would be any problems we would have with it? Is there anything we would question or everybody's pretty quiet. <clears throat> it takes a bit to go through some of this, but I mean the structure itself would look to be valid. Okay. But in, in the overall, it's a structure and we're not yet applying the flesh to the structure or coming to a conclusion. Right. But we can see with the structure that we shouldn't, we shouldn't just reject it. It's like when Odilio did his presentations on uh, the mandates, when he did his presentation on Nero, or when he did his presentation um, and, and also that new symbol of 1629 that he, we found. Um, and then um, he did his presentation on the upper room studies. In all of these things, we could see that the math is correct, that the symbols are there. The question is, how do we interpret them?
and and we know that you know Trump being elected is part of a prophecy we predicted. But then we had this whole situation with Trump losing this election because there's this civil war going on. And so one thing at least we should say is that we should expect a civil war, in a sense, to be acted out in the midterm election. So Colin's argument is that we have this prophecy of Daniel chapter 3, we have Daniel chapter 11, the first few verses. We have Revelation 17. We have uh, the puzzle dealing with the seven kings and the eighth. And so in his understanding, he's going to say that we have this evidence that Trump's going to come back into power. And since we have this structure here now that's, that's more mapped out than what Colin had done numerically, at least with its witnesses, it would appear that we have something that looks like it fits what Colin is saying. But can we just take a structure and just because we have the dates, can we say that that's, because we've done this all through this, this history. When we looked at November 9th, did our predictions come to pass? No, they didn't. They didn't come to pass. So the things we were expecting. And and for Heidi and I, when we made the Thanksgiving Day prediction, the reason we were doing it was to see, can we predict events in the future? We knew we had this November 9th date way in the future, a year in the future. And so we saw these civil wars um, in the United States, the rebellion in, in ancient Israel. We could connect them all to our time. We could connect them to Trump being elected. We could connect them to the November 22nd, 2018 date, the Thanksgiving in the United States. But we couldn't predict what events were going to occur. So, so for me, it was, well, maybe we can't predict events. But we had so many witnesses for July 18th and for November 9th. And, but the events we predicted didn't come to pass. So what was the problem? And, and we spent a lot of time in our morning studies going through the pioneers' understanding of things. And our problem was the same as theirs. So what was the problem? If we're gonna sum it up in one word, what is the problem that the pioneers had? when they made their predictions about October 22nd, 1844, and all the other predictions they made that didn't happen. External. Okay, you're saying it's external? That they were trying to predict external? No, their, their, their position was that they were predicting an external event. Okay. When it was internal. Okay, internal. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, that's probably valid to some degree. I mean, this was something happening in heaven. They're expecting something to happen on earth. Right. They were they were expecting a literal external event to occur on the earth. Right. So they did they didn't get the event right. I think you're right. The word I was thinking is one of perspective. That is, they were myopic, they were nearsighted. They were looking at a fixed date and expecting things to happen at a certain time so they had the wrong event and so when they looked at the nation that was being given to them they misinterpreted it they they felt that well because we have this date all of all of the things that we are expecting are tied up they're going to all come together at this date and we had the same thing with july 18th even though we had some dates in the future we we thought that Everything's come coming together now. It's all making sense. Yeah. Does somebody have something to say, Angela? I think your mic is on. Okay, so you don't have anything to add here. Um, but but yeah, so we we have done the same thing. We were looking for external events, but God was trying to teach us something internal. Now the suggestion is, well, 
we were wrong last time, but this time we're going to be correct. Is that a good argument? No, because the future is in God's hands. So how can we make predictions at all? Okay, so did we learn that we can predict events, that we can only measure time, we can't see until after the time has passed what it means? Mm -hmm. Is that what we learned? We know that the the group that on December 6th, 2020, made their declaration, they just dismissed time altogether. So they didn't want us to have any dates in the future. But we know that we still need to measure time. But can, this, what's that? In this situation, we need to be able to measure time because it is helping us to understand many of the way marks that we've already observed in the past. Yeah. If we are unwilling to accept the light from what has already occurred, are we not denying the light that is behind us that is to light our way on the path for the future? Right. So we can't deny that light. And we will make the same mistakes if we deny the light from behind us. Exactly. And, and so in order to know, and, and we don't want to make the same mistakes. So we have all these symbols, but we're still sort of persisting, at least from my perspective. We're kind of, we're doing the same thing, but expecting different results. And I don't think that that's reasonable. Right? I don't think we should be time setting. We can look at dates in the future, but we can't know what they mean until they have passed. Because we've done this before. And, and, and all of the witnesses that we have show that we can, we can find dates. And those dates are valid. But we can't predict the events. Now, Colin has an expression is time will tell. And I don't like that expression. Because what's the problem with saying that time will tell? I mean, Colin and I could argue about it, I guess. But what, what's the problem? What would be the problem with time will tell? We're not preparing at all. Future events. Okay. Now, let's let's put it this way. We we had some studies where we went through all of the these these chronologies, and, and I think I made the statement in one of the studies that, um, and it might have just been me and Heidi talking, but we are to watch and wait. Correct. Watching and waiting. We're not supposed to time set according to the spirit of prophecy, but we're supposed to watch and wait. What does it mean to watch and wait? How is that often interpreted by Seventh day Adventists? Watch and wait. Literally to sit around and watch and wait. <laughs> Is it is it very active on most Adventists' part? No. It's waiting without watching for the most part, yes. So, so they just think one day something's going to come along, it's just going to pop up, and we'll recognize it. And since we're Seventh-day Adventists and we know, you know that Jesus is not, you know, he's not going to come back secretly, we're going to look for his visible return, 
And we know that Saturday is the Sabbath, so a Sunday law can't deceive us. And, and so they use watching and waiting as a way of really not doing anything, just kind of enjoying their life on earth, waiting until something happens that they're then going to wake up and do something. Um, but, of course, they get caught up in the spirit of the world and won't even discern because they're not really watching. So what's the problem with the time will tell statement in that context? It's the same mentality. Okay, well, I don't know if it's the same. It's, it's related. Mm. But what's the problem? The time will tell. I mean, Colin's been using it for a long time. He used it, I believe, for November 9th, but I know for certain he used it with July 18th. Well, to me, it suggests that if what is uh, predicted comes about, then they have made a correct assessment, but that may not be necessarily true. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... So we could end up being deceived even if things, even if time sort of brings about something that we think is a fulfillment, right? So time doesn't tell. What tells? How do we know if something is true or not? Because October 22nd, 1844, if you said time will tell, what would your be conclusion be after October 22nd, 1844? There were many <clears throat> after October 22nd, 1844, that when they once held the banner of the inerrancy of biblical prophecy, mm -hmm. they chose to walk away from that banner on October 23rd, 1844, because they could not believe that this date, this time, was correct. Right. Yeah, you, what you're doing is you're opening up the door for rejection of light. So when it came to July 18th, it didn't matter to me whether that event was going to happen or not. Because we already had a miracle. We had... The prophecies of the past come together in our time to witness to events within this movement. October 13th, 2018, was a prediction that did come to pass, but differently than predicted. And September 7th, uh, 2019, measuring the time. As we've measured the time, we have these witnesses that what we're doing is guided by God. It's no chance. It's not happenstance. It's not luck. It's not a coincidence. These structures and designs keep being witnessed to over and over again in multiple ways. And so we know that this is true. But we also have been given strong witness from God that we cannot time set. We can measure time, but when we're going to predict an event, we're going to be wrong. But what if we're right, but we're wrong? So right, but in the, for the wrong reason. Well, what if some things do turn out the way that people expect? So let's just say a scenario. Let's say Trump does get elected somehow. Would, is that the thing that we would have as the witness that we're correct in our interpretation of prophecy? I mean, because he could. I mean, it, it is very unlikely. But, I mean, there could be something happen unforeseen that could put Trump at the reins again. 
But would that be the fulfillment of prophecy? Everything that we've had has witnessed to the fact that our line is a typical line. It's a type. Where Samuel Snow's letters were not, even though Samuel Snow's letters, July 18th letter, typifies October 22nd, 1844. We know that October 22nd, 1844, even itself, is not the Sunday law. Right, even though it points to the Sunday law, it typifies it. So we have all these typifications. I don't think that we can expect a Sunday law to be something that we can predict or even the events connected with it other than in type. So I think we have types here, but I don't think we have the reality. But if Satan somehow managed to work it, he could have things appear to unfold in a certain way. And what would be the problem if we accepted external events as evidence instead of the structure that God has given us as evidence? I don't know if I'm asking that question in a clear way. We're trusting our senses instead of God. Oh, so our senses, can they be trusted? No. Absolutely not. How are we to walk? By faith. By faith. By faith. What part of our senses are by faith? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> None of them. So one of the things that I see, so this is the thing that bothers me the most, both with what Odili has presented and with what Colin has presented. Is this as seen very similar to what we had with November 9th, what we had with July 18th, as some kind of vindication of this movement? Now, I argue, of course, if Trump is elected, if he becomes president again, it's there's no vindication whatsoever. That is, we're not the only one predicting Trump being reelected. And it's true there might be some people who really know about our message who might say, oh, I guess you guys were right about that. But I doubt it would have any kind of impact on getting our message to Seventh-day Adventists. Now, maybe I could be wrong on that, but from my perspective, it wouldn't really help us. But I think the bigger problem is... Um, that we would see people accepting a witness which is not the type of witness that God is giving us because we know that Satan can do miracles. Satan can appear as Christ. He can do miracles. How do we know they're not real? Because the world will see them all. We'll see the glory of God, I mean. Okay, so the world is going to see the same thing. So if we, if, if Trump gets reelected, there would be a lot of other groups lined up to be vindicated before this movement could be vindicated. And those people are completely off, you know, in their understanding of prophecy. And we could say, well, they're going to look at Trump as a good guy. But that doesn't really matter, does it? Okay. As, yeah. as, as, a, as an example. Yeah. There were 12 disciples, right? Yeah. Now, of the 12 disciples, we had two of them that were named Simon, right? Yeah. So you have Simon Peter and... Uh, well, Simon Zelotes or. Okay, Simon the Zealot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the Zealots looked to overthrow the rule of Rome. How? Through military might. Okay. Now, all of the disciples looked for the literal setting up of Christ's kingdom at his first incarnation, right? Mm -hmm. 
They were all believing that he was going to establish himself on the throne of David during his lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now, would that have been a situation that would have created an issue for many Jews at that time? Wouldn't they have welcomed, many, many Jews would have welcomed this? Yeah. Yet when he went on the cross, there were many that believed in him that walked away because now this is not going to be a earthly kingdom. Okay. Exactly. So the comparison that we're making here is very simple. There are many within the church, many within evangelical Christianity that believe Trump is going to, again, assume power. Yeah. Yet, in this situation, none of them are looking to honor God through this situation. Right. Mm -hmm. are, they, are they seeking that their characters are to be changed? Are they seeking to draw closer to Christ? Are they seeking to have a understanding of the covenant? Or even, even a, more, a more complete understanding of what it really means to enter into rest? Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't see any of this happening. No, I know. So, and, and so this is the thing that troubles me the most. Um, both Colin and um, Odelia have expressed this sentiment. We were right about Trump. And it's going to be shown that we were correct. Now, they're saying, if we, if we reject the idea that Trump is the last president of the United States, then we're rejecting this message. That's the argument. But I'm arguing that Trump is the last president of the United States in the typical line that we see. That is, we're going to see the siege of Washington, D.C. is going to mark um, the globalists taking over. We, we can go back to the Trump prophecy and look at the fact that, that Xerxes loses to Greece. And to me, this is what's being shown. And we don't see Xerxes coming back into power. We see a new power. And so that new power symbolically now is in control of the United States. Even if there is a civil war going on, we, we can't expect that this means all of the things that we have predicted before, we can now just move over to this history because we have to recognize that we were essentially wrong just as the Millerites were wrong. So what did the Millerites do? The ones who, who said, well, we were wrong about October 22nd, 1844. So the seventh month movement was wrong, but what did they still do for a while? Many of the Millerites. There setting dates for the dates okay so they kept setting dates was that correct no 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 so when we studied early writings page 74 we went into that in depth and we could see that the idea that we can now set dates and even for those who accepted october 22nd 1844 as a valid date like jo joseph bates who just said well maybe there's seven years Ellen White didn't accept that idea. We can't set dates for the event. Really what she's saying is we can't look for that event on a date, the second coming of Christ. What we have to do is be watching and waiting. We don't know the day or the hour. That will be proclaimed after the special resurrection, after the plagues after the close of probation. 
after the Sunday law. All these things have to happen before then. So if we're going to be like the Millerites, we have a choice. We can continue to look for some kind of vindication that we were right, or we can accept the lesson that God was trying to teach us. And God is witnessing to us still. He's still, in all of this, giving us light for our feet. Now, to me, the amazing study that Adilio gave is the upper room study. And I got a completely different message from that study, just as I did um, from his other study um, dealing with uh, the one that had 629 in it. And we looked back at, at the, the verses uh, that was um, Exodus 629, Leviticus 629, 1629, pardon me, I always say 6, 1629, and um, number 1629. We didn't have a, a Genesis 1629 or a Deuteronomy 1629 to look at. And when we looked at the message that was there in those verses, it was a different message than what Odilio was trying to get from that symbol. And so we have the same thing here. God's giving us the symbols, and he's doing it because he's merciful. But if we reinterpret these symbols just again well we're just moving this over we're, we're going to be time setting then we're making the same mistake as the millerites did who continued to time set and eventually they lost their way some earlier some later so so we need to recognize what what has happened in the past is solid and, and we don't need to look again for some event to vindicate us. And we can't predict that event. We're still going through this experience that we began when we started to set dates back in 2018. We're still passing through this history. But at some point, we need to learn the lessons that God has shown us. We can still measure the time. We can see this is valid. But what's not valid is what we expect to see and, and our reasons for expecting to see it. Um, so let's, let's look at the scriptures. Um, so we're, we're just going to go back to uh, what was so this, this is almost like a change here I want to look at Revelation 13 actually because um, someone asked me some questions and when we read things, um, we sometimes miss details. And why do we miss details? What, what's the various reasons we would miss something? There's a few different ones, but what are some of the main ones? Preconceived ideas. Okay, so we have assumptions. That is confirmation bias. We have a certain idea, and when we read it, we just read into what we already think about something. And so we have to learn to read carefully and prayerfully, compare scripture with scripture. And when something doesn't look right, we have to go to God, ask him for light, and he may not give us light right away. And there's lots of things in these chapters, Revelation 12, 13, and 17, that I've struggled with for more than 35 years. So there's, there's things I never have had answers to because I didn't understand what was going on. I had all these assumptions, and, and not, we're all the same. We all have assumptions. We all bring to uh, the Scripture our, our ideas that we already have. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because we know that we have a solid foundation, and if we have used the Bible in the spirit of prophecy to guide us, 
we're, we're going to see most things correctly. But we know there's going to be some things that God is going to have to correct. Now, this second beast. So let's just go through these verses and look at some of the things it's saying. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. So who is this? And when is it? So this is kind of like a review, but. When, when does Ellen White say this is? You say per, you say first eleven there what you say yeah so Ellen White talks about this and she tells us when it is so this is going to be seventeen ninety eight United yeah United States yeah but it's going to be seventeen ninety eight and this beast <laughs> is going to be the United States so we know that's certain we're not going to have any problems with that and he has two horns like a lamb. So what are those two horns? Republicanism. Protestantism. And we have no doubt about that, right? Because this nope. is going to be the state power, right? The government, republicanism, and the church power, Protestantism. And they're separated when it rises in 1798. But then it says, and he spake as a dragon. So how does, how does the... What is this speaking referring to? How does Ellen White define that? How does the United States speak? Their actions. Okay, I heard two people at the same time. So, Chris? Sorry. I was just saying by the laws that it creates, the legislation it creates. Okay, and, and who else do they say pretty much the same thing? By its actions. Okay, so by its actions. So, yeah, Ellen White says that it's going to be through its legislation, legislative power that it's going to speak as a dragon. So it's going to enact laws. And so we know that the United States has this separation of church and state and that's how it appears. But there's a deceptive power underneath it. Now, it's not going to speak as a dragon in 1798. This is something that's going to have. So that means we're brought from 1798 to the future. When it says he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the United States is going to do the world to do, cause the world, all the earth, to do what? Wonder after the beast. Yeah. So it's going to cause all the world to worship the first beast. And that first beast is this beast here, right? Revelation 13, the beast from the sea, which is the papacy. And, and he's going to, one of the things he's going to do is he's going to do with great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. So what is this referring to? What's the reference here? What is this referencing? Okay, it's the Sunday law. These are the miracles, but what is it referencing? Where is it? Where would we look at this? What story in the Bible is it referencing? Elijah. Okay, this would be Elijah, wouldn't it? On Mount Carmel. So could the false priests cause fire to come down from heaven. Yeah. 
Yes. Well, well, they couldn't, right? So Elijah could, but the, the priests of Baal, they couldn't back in the past, not at Carmel. But can they at the end of the world? Can the false prophet, can the false priests? Yeah, so yes, that's what I thought you meant was at the end, sorry. Yeah, so at the end, yeah, that's fine. I, that's what I figured you, you were thinking. So we know at the beginning they couldn't, but now they can. So there's a change that has happened in order to allow them to do that. And he deceiveth and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So this is the two-horned lamb, this beast that has two horns like a lamb. He's going to have this power. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. And he's going to do great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he's going to deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by a sword and did live. Now we have this image to the beast. Is the image to the beast the United States? Somebody asked me this question on Facebook. They were having trouble with it. So when we talk about the image to the beast, in verse 14, is this talking about the United States? Does the United States become an image to the beast? The image on the papacy, the force in Sunday law. Okay. So... But is that what this is saying? Because we have this beast, and it's going to make an image to the beast. It can't be the same. The image to the beast cannot be the United States. The image be Sunday law. Okay, so we know it has to do with the Sunday law. But there's the Sunday law itself, which is the mark of the beast. But we have this image to the beast. So it's something that is connected to the Sunday law, but it's not the Sunday law itself. And it's going to have power. It's going to make this image to the beast, which had a wound by a sword and did live. So this is the papacy that's been resurrected. And he had power. Yeah, so combination of church and state is the image, is what Iran says. Um, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So we have this image of the beast. which can't be the second beast, but it's connected to it. That is, it's going to have power to take an image. So normally when you have an image, can an image uh speak does it have life when you have an idol is it alive no does life it... no life no life no but in this case we see something quite different we see that the idol or the image can actually live and it can speak which normally images don't they're dumb, right? They're lifeless. But this image to the beast is going to have life and it has the power to speak. The States does have the power to speak. It's going to speak as a dragon. But this speaking here can't just be the United States speaking. This is the image of the beast speaking. The United States has made this image to the beast. And the image of this beast is going to live and speak. And it's going to cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast. So when it says, and cause as many, it's referring back to the lamb-like beast, the two-horned beast, two horns like a lamb. It's going to cause 
that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now we can say that the image of the beast is church and state, but is this just referring to church and state in the United States? Universal Sunday law. Universal. Okay. Well, this isn't even necessarily talking about a Sunday law yet, because it's just worshiping the image of the beast. We know that there's going to be the mark of the beast. That's going to come later. We know the image of the beast test is first, correct? According to Spirit of Prophecy. Yep. So we yep. have an image of the beast test. And then we have the Sunday law that follows. And for many Adventists, they're going to fail when the image of the beast test happens. Because they're expecting a Sunday law first. But there has to be an image of the beast test first. Now, some people would argue that the image of the beast test has been the pandemic. I'm not saying that, that this is what Colin's saying or, or anything, but, but I've seen it amongst Adventists. Um, they'll say, well, we have this Sunday law, and this is like the image of the beast. We see church and state coming together, and this is, this is a preparation for the Sunday law. And if we get the vaccine, then we've lost that. We fail that test and we, we can't, you know, we won't stand at the Sunday law because we keep giving in. And, and I think there is some kind of typical validity to that. Um, I just don't believe that the vaccine was the test. But anyway, go on. Well, Sister, White says, as, Sister White says it'll be given to worldly demands. Right. Um, you, you've heard that quote before. Yeah. And that would be with worship, though, right? So, I mean, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to get a vaccine ever, but um, I don't believe that people who got the vaccine who did not, um, you know, we're present truth Adventists, you know, we, we know better. And we could say, well, everybody should know better. But, you know, not everybody's got the same information. You know, some people have no idea about vaccines right now people are becoming aware as we look at the aftermath and we're going to be looking at that for years probably but i don't think that this was anything more than a typical sunday law it was a type it wasn't the actual test but we do see that the image of the beast has been forming it was part of that what's happened here is is part of what's leading to the Sunday law. We can see that quite clearly. I just don't think it's the test that Ellen White says is the image of the beast test because this has to do with worship, right? Because you can see here, as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I know she says worldly demands, worldly demands. Yep, in the context of worship, right? Yeah, part of that, I think. Yeah. Part of it. Because if it's not about worship, um, I mean, because there's lots of worldly demands that happen that we have to give into because they're they're not they're not a test of our our faith, things that we don't like. Like but that's not what she's talking. She's not just saying any worldly demand. She's talking the ones that have to do with worship. So if they're going to try to control my conscience as far as worship, but but even then, this is talking about a an image to the beast that can both speak and live. And, and the question is, what exactly is it? Do we know? Do we know exactly what it looks like? Now, we can see that many Adventists and many people in the world have woken up to the fact that the government has a lot more power over our lives uh, than we would like them to have. And they can exercise that power anytime they want, and there's not much we can do about it. So, 
it gets in our way of the relationship with God, then it's, you know, yeah, or even our health. Yeah. All I know is that me personally, I had nothing. There's, I, I didn't have a problem wearing a mask at the guitar store, um, just from the very fact that you have to show respect to other people. And um, I think they're stupid. They don't work. But they're not going to they're not going to hurt my health. I mean, I didn't have a mask that stopped me from breathing. I made sure I had a mask that was loose enough. It didn't affect my breathing. But nonetheless, um, I didn't feel that actually much happened uh, personally, other than all of these annoying things definitely didn't affect my relationship with God. I wasn't tested in any way that I can think of, um, you know, so so I don't think it was the image of the beast test from my perspective. But I know some people did have, you know, lose their jobs and so forth. Um, so so I'm not saying that nobody was tested in some way, but I'm just saying I personally never ran into anything that I would call a test. Um, and so. But we but we know it's a type, right? So we can agree on that. Now he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So what do people do with this verse generally? What are they looking for? A literal mark. They're looking for a literal mark. It could be. UPC code back in the 70s when those came out. Um, you know, it could be some kind of a little transistor in a, or some kind of little, uh, what do they call them, nano, nano uh, bot or something inside. Nanotechnology. It. Nanotechnology or whatever, which I know quite a bit about. And uh, so uh, I don't think they have nanotechnology that can do the things that people are claiming they could do. But, but be that as it may, we know that what this is talking about is symbolic language. And the right hand is not literally the right hand, and the forehead is not literally the forehead. We're not going to see a literal mark in people's right hands or foreheads. The right hand represents what? What we do. Okay, what we do, our actions. The foreheads? The laborer. The assent or the agreement with what is going on. Right. So so, so the intellectual assent to this error. So people are, now, the ones who receive the mark in their right hand, they may not necessarily agree with what's happening, but they're going to go along with it. Right? When it comes to the Sunday law, their, their, their heart isn't in it or their mind isn't in it. But some are really going to have the mark in their foreheads. Now, both these have to do with character as well, because your actions and your thoughts, right? So this is that have to do with our character. We can see a person's character by their actions. We can see what they think by what they do. And then we have that no man might buy or sell, save he that had a mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now, do we take this literally? There are many that try to apply it literally. Okay. But can this be just talking about that we can't buy or sell? How, would, how else could we present that? Okay, so what could buying or selling represent? Symbol. Because here we're dealing with things and we mix in symbols and literal. And, and it doesn't mean that literal doesn't occur, because literal can occur, but the primary application of something must be symbolic, because the book of Revelation is written in symbols. Let's so talk Okay. So so sometimes we just we just kind of accept the things we've heard. We know that this person has to have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 18, what's the buying and selling about? When all the merchants are killed, what is that about with the fall of Babylon? Destruction of the economy. Okay, it's this destruction of the economy. But there's a lot of other symbolism here um, that really represents worship. Why do I say that? Because what is this all about? The fall of Babylon. Who's the, this woman is going to fall? She says, I, am, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Now this is not a literal woman, is it? It can't be. No. It can't be. Of course you know, not. the papacy, it's a church. And the kings of the earth that committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her. Now, so we, we say that this woman is not real, you know, that it's, it's not literal, that it's symbolizing the church. But the kings of the earth, they're, what is it that they're mourning? Because is the papacy the way that they actually make their living? I mean, if we think about it, the economy of, of the Vatican is pretty small. So why are the merchants of the earth weeping and mourning over the va the death of the papacy? Isn't this more symbolic of its religion? Well, they've been fornicating with her as well. Right. So, and, and we don't think about generally as businessmen you know, that in order for them to be access, successful, they need to commit fornication with the papacy. People can be very successful, have no connection to the papacy at all. So I don't think this is talking really about merchants in the, in the literal sense. It has to be symbolic. And so these people had the control over the buying and the selling. And now they have nobody to buy anything anymore. Is it they won't buy anything anymore? Or and is that because they don't have any desire to, to have it? Or because they don't have anything to buy it with? Or both? Well, because Babylon has fallen. The papacy has lost its power. Right? It's, it's not going to have... It's not going to be able to sell its merchandise anymore. And right. its merchandise is its doctrines, its teachings, its deception. Its ideas. Its it's influence. influence. Yes, the influence of the papacy is going to be taken away. Now, so if we go back to no man might buy or sell then, um, so that means we can't practice our religion. Isn't that what we understand by this? That we're not going to be able to worship on Sabbath. We're not going to be able to meet together. And so, you know, we look at it as like, well, if you don't get this mark, you're not going to be able to buy anything at the grocery store. But this has to be something more than that. So you say it has a twofold meaning? Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's going to be economic pressure. But I don't think that's the main problem. Because I think some people aren't going to experience what they expect. They're just going to lose because they... Because they don't have this connection with God, they can still worship the way that they want to worship, and the papacy isn't going to have any problem with them. 
Seventh-day Adventists, many of them will be able to worship just as they've always worshipped. And they won't see a Sunday law. But if our thoughts are controlled, if we're, you know, and they could be shutting down, you know, house churches, they could be all kinds of things happening. I don't know. I'm not trying to say what exactly is going to happen. But I think that we have to look at this as much more than just this idea of a Sunday law showing up in the newspapers one day. And that we've seen in what's happened with the pandemic, something that's akin to that, but on the line of worship. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, at this point, it does. Okay. Let me, let me give you an example. Okay. Several years ago, I was attending a church that many would consider to be fairly liberal. Okay. Now, we would, we would have conversations after church, and I had one friend that came up to me in front of several others, and he made the comment that as he'd been reading Revelation, he understood that the fifth trumpet had not yet sounded. And his comment to me at that point was, boy, when, when, when this really starts to happen, then I know I've got to get ready. I know I have to be ready because Christ is going to come again really, really soon. And I didn't have much to say to him. Now, a month, maybe a month and a half went by, and we're talking again. And we're in front of the same people. And I, I walked up to him and I said, you know, brother, your comment about the fifth trumpet. Oh, yes, I remember it well. When that fifth trumpet begins to sound, then I've got to get ready. I looked him straight in the face and I said, well, I hate to tell you this, but the fifth trumpet has already sounded. And we started going into historical applications of this. And one of the other men that was there came up and he said, well, you know, Dwight's right. The fifth trumpet has already sounded. Now, from that day forward, this brother has been very focused about telling everybody about the coming Sunday law. Mm -hmm. Now, throughout my time with the Adventist Church, that's one of the things that has been repeatedly being addressed mm -hmm. is that the Sunday law is soon to come. Get ready, get ready. The Sunday law is soon to come. Mm -hmm. Now, we look back at history. When A.T. Jones argued before Congress on the Blair Bill, mm -hmm. it did not pass at that time. Yet, what does Mrs. White say about this, this type of situation? Does she not tell us that this has been going on in darkness? Yeah. Does that representation of the darkness tell us that this has been going on in secret mm -hmm. without people being able to see it yeah and, it, and it's not just that i think that there's people behind the scenes just you know planning to bring in the sunday laws that that this darkness is it's all around us in some ways if we have spiritual eyesight, we can see it in movies, in television, in all forms of entertainment, in politics, in religion. I mean, almost everything we see is preparing us to receive this mark of the beast. And 
I know I'm not explaining myself well, but the what I see is that when I read the spirit of prophecy and when I read the Bible, and, and we've talked about this, that God wants to enter into covenant with us. We, we have no idea about what it is that we have to do to prepare for the Sunday law. Because we think, well, we just need to study the Bible and know what's going to happen. And, and a lot of Adventists, that's sort of what prophecy is, is about. It's kind of like, I need to know what's going to happen so I don't get deceived. But it's a whole mindset that prepares us. So by the time the Sunday law comes, we've already bought into that whole system of thinking. And, and the problem that I see is we have a wrong idea about what it need, means to be prepared. That is, we think we're ready for the Sunday law. We think that we could step past this test, but we have no idea what that test is. Because we think it's simple, but it's not simple because it has to do with your character. If you have an unchrist like character, are you going to pass the Sunday law? You can't. You can't. Even if you think. You know, well, I know, I'm keeping the Sabbath strictly. I'm, I'm doing all the right things. But if you are jealous, if you are a, a gossip, if you think of you, yourself more highly than you ought to, I mean, there's so many things about our characters that need to be transformed. And so the image of the beast test, to me, is something that has to do with our religious thought. And we have been going through the image of the beast test for a long time already. And when we, we come out at the end of that test, before the actual Sunday law, we will already have a character that's not going to be able to stand the test of the Sunday law. And we will think that we are right. And, and we saw this happen with many of our friends when Parminder and Tess changed people 180 degrees in their thinking. And people don't realize how easy it's going to be if we're unchristlike for Satan to manipulate us. And, and we think that we're, we're, we're preparing ourselves, but we're ignoring the very things that God's trying to show us about ourselves that need to change. Hi, guys. Hi, Mark. And I apologize. I forgot your birthday today. Okay. And... I am, I am be very sorry. I miss uh, all the whole thing. Yeah, you missed the whole thing pretty much because we're we're just going to be closing up here. Yes. Um. Could you be a? I'll meet you for kiss up. I don't want to read the newspaper from you. Okay. <laughs> well, the one thing that we we've done. Mark, so just kind of, I'm going to give a summary, I guess. Um, God has been wanting to do a work in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds, and he's given us the means. And what is the means that he's given us so that we could be converted? What is, it, what is it that God has done so that somebody who thinks he's all right, that he has this subjective way of looking at himself and he thinks he's okay, that he's going to have a conviction brought to him that he can see his true spiritual condition? What has God given us to do that? Scripture. Okay, yeah. 
So we have scripture. The Holy Spirit. Okay, so we have the Holy Spirit, and we understand this from um, John uh, chapter 14 and 15 and 16, where he talks about this. Um, the Holy to... Spirit will lead us into all truth. Yeah, so there's all this section here in um, where he's going to talk about the Comforter. Right, he, he promises the spirit. The people aren't going to receive him. Yeah. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Jesus. Missing grace. You give us wisdom too if we ask for wisdom. Yeah. And yeah, the so that word right you said that to uh, my mom, he made like he, that you did say, yes. I agree with you that I make a missing grace. Yeah. So so if we you know if we read it, and we're not going to read all the, these chapters here, but we can see that the Holy Spirit's going to bring something to us that's very different than what the world brings to us. And that we're going to learn, he's going to teach us all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And he's going to give us peace. And um, in chapter 15, he talks about, I am the vine, you are the branches. Talks about the hatred of yeah, the world. The of the What's that? Yeah, the fruits. Talk about the fruits of the spirit. Yeah, the fruits yeah. of the spirit. Now, when we talk about the hatred of the world, you know, we can frame this in such a way that we think, well, I hate the world. Because, you know, I don't like, you know, worldly music and I don't like... Um, you know, worldly entertainment, and I, I don't like worldly dress, and I don't like worldly food. And, and so we think we have the hatred of the world, but yet our thoughts are really not much different than the world in how we think about ourselves and think about others. It's like the Pharisees, you know. Right. So we can think, well, I, I don't love the world, but we can have the same attitude as the Pharisee in the story of the Pharisee and the publican. You are way about that too. Yeah. You are way about that. And I say to all everybody where me, I tell them that same way you said now of tonight. Yeah. So, um, in John 16, Jesus says, starting in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, or if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove or convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. Of sin, because they believed not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged and Ellen White adds and now shall be cast out I have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now so we know that this is a three-step testing prophetic message sin righteousness and judgment and that God has given us these reform lines he's given us an objective evidence of who he is of his power and if we understand it correctly it speaks against our nature. That is, the truth presents before us a cross. Because if the truth, what we call the truth, flatters us, it's not the truth. Correct? Right. Correct. Yeah, the truth does not flatter man. Now, when I was a young man, well, I was a teenager, but... Um, when I started studying seriously, you know, about the age of 14, uh, to study religious material, you know, I'd, I'd played around with it before, but I really wanted to become a Christian. So I started studying. And I read lots of different religious books. I read the Book of Mormon. I read um, a lot of the Koran um, and different types of Eastern religions and so forth. And what I noticed is that they all flattered man but the bible didn't 
The Bible didn't make say things to us to make us feel good about ourselves. The Bible showed us who we really are. It showed the so-called heroes of the Bible, which are heroes, but it showed them as men, faulty men. And you don't see this in other religions. Their religious people are without fault. They become like gods. But we don't see that in the Bible. Of course, you know, the Catholic Church makes them into saints and so forth. But in the Bible, we see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way through the Bible, these people who are not perfect in, in, in the sense that we would try to define perfect. Yet God will declare many of them as righteous because he's working in their lives. So God wants us to be righteous. And he brings these people through an experience that changes them. And that's what this is all about. Everything that we're studying here is about changing us. And my argument is that if we're taking this, these interpretations of what God has been showing us and, and flattering ourselves with it, we are walking on enchanted ground. There's nothing here to flatter humanity. We are not going to be vindicated in the eyes of our friends until after the thousand years when the, when the holy city comes down and we see them on the other side of the wall looking into the city. Only then will there be a vindication and it will not be very pleasant. It'll be very bitter. Christ presents before us a cross. This message has been a cross. And yet many of us want to avoid that cross. We think we can avoid it. We think that we can predict some event that's going to vindicate us. And I think that's a mistake based on everything that I've experienced in my life as a Seventh-day Adventist, as a Christian, and everything I've experienced in this movement tells me that we are far from God and, and God has a lot of things to do if we're going to accomplish the task that he has given us. We have to come to the upper room. We have to be converted. And we have to see ourselves as we truly are. And it took the disciples a lot of heart searching for that to happen. We can see that God witnesses to, to these dates. It took a disappointment for the disciples to start to, starting to wake up. And we're going to, if we continue predicting things and they don't come to pass, it's not going to benefit us. We can't say time will tell. Time will take its toll upon those who look for the literal fulfillment of what God is giving us here symbolically. And he's witnessing with something objective. And, and if we don't understand what he's witnessing, dates are going to pass, and we will eventually just reject that everything God supposedly did was just of man. We're going to come to the same conclusions that those at FFA came to on December 6th. And, and, and we can't afford to do that. So, you know, I, I believe that Colin isn't, isn't wrong. I don't think that we can take his chart here and just dismiss it because it has too many witnesses. But the interpretation of what this means, I think that we have to, we have to study this together and come to an understanding of it. Because he's making a prediction. He doesn't see it that way. You know, he says, I'm not making a prediction. I'm just putting this out there just as for some people to study. But people have taken it as a prediction. People are hanging their hopes on this happening. And it's even being presented as a test that if we don't accept it, not by Colin, but by Odilio, 
That's my understanding of what Adilio says, that if we don't accept it, we close our probation. We can't wait and see. We can't say time will tell. Right? So his perspective's even worse in that, that sense than Collins. But they're both really the same, and we're really not that much different from the disciples in what they were looking for and in the Millerites after October 22nd, 1844, what they were looking for and what man has always looked for, something that they can see so that they don't have to have faith anymore. But faith is way better than sight. It's way more powerful. It's way more convicting. It's way more strengthening. And it's the only thing that's going to get us through the time of Jacob's trouble, through the time when the, we have to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. And we are unprepared. We would not be able to pass through that test in the condition that we are now. And we need to know it. And God's given us the ability to see it if we're willing to look. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, for your time. I went a little longer than I wanted to, but I tend to on Friday nights. And um, we got Collins, or not Collins study, uh, Dwight study in the morning at 7, just like we do regularly. And, and I sent out notes for that, so look in your email for those notes. Um, and, and Dwight, you're still going to be doing Zephaniah, but you're, we're just doing this little detour, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, which is 1 Kings chapter 11, which Heidi and I read last night. Um, and we're going to see how this even, all of these things weigh into what we're studying here. All of these things are connected. Um, and then, of course, Stephen doesn't have a study tomorrow, next Sabbath. As we continue through our studies in the mornings, uh, because it's been uh, a real eye-opener the last couple of weeks, what we're seeing. and. You also know, some of you know, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but, you know, we're planning on April 30th um, to have a Sabbath service that, that we're going to host, whether um, other people are doing a Sabbath service, people can have a choice, I guess. Uh, but we really want to, to come together and... Um, You're going to have... Uh... What's that? Uh, we're going to have, um, what's his name, speak? We don't know name. yet. We don't, we, we don't, at least I don't know. Toby, yet. Toby, at least Toby. So it'd be really nice to have Toby speak. That's who we would like to speak. Yeah, that would be good. Um, and, and I've been praying, you know, and, and some things have been happening behind the scenes in communication with other people, some good, some bad. Um, but I really believe that, uh, um, we need to have that upper room experience, and and that's an and that's a miracle. The upper room experience is a miracle. It's it's not something that humans can do. You can't just, as Joan says, you know, let bygones be bygones, bury the hatchet, you know, turn over a new leaf. All these different little expressions we have. Um, we actually have to be reconciled to Christ in order to be reconciled to each other. You can't reconcile man to man if he's not reconciled to God. And so, so this is a work that God is bringing us to. And I, I'm not saying it's going to happen on April 30th or anything like that. I believe that we have to go through these experiences however long it takes. Um, but God definitely has a work to do with each one of us as individuals. And that's really what we should be seeking. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer?
Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the Sabbath, for the fellowship, the love of Christ that can be manifested in sinful human beings. We pray, Lord, for this movement, for this church, for the meetings that are planned. And we know, Lord, that you wouldn't be giving us this light if you don't want to speak, wanting to speak to us. You want to speak to us, and you want us to come to you. We pray for Adilio, for Daniel Fontenot, for Stephen, for Colin, for Dwight and myself, and all others who present in various ways, whether just in small groups or one-on-one. -on -one. We ask, Lord, that um, you can humble us, that you can break us, and that we can be open to your leading, that we can take up our cross. And we pray this for each one of us, Lord. We pray that we can be an example to our brethren in the way that we speak to and about each other. And we pray, Lord, that, that your love will be manifest in our lives. Forgive us for our sins, for our hardness of heart, for our blindness, for our indolence. And help us, Lord, to take up our cross and follow you to search diligently in your word and to receive the work of the Holy Spirit in exposing our sins, your righteousness, and bringing us to the judgment that will be found, that we will be found in favor with you. Be with us um, this evening. Give us a good rest. and Bring us together tomorrow morning is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.